by His infinite and powerful grace, we can stand. and welcome to Revelations of Prophecy. We're glad to see each of you here tonight and those of you that are watching. We welcome you. This is right now the, the Sabbath. We learned already earlier this past week that Sabbath starts when? Friday evening. So I believe the sun has set here in the Philippines. Biblically, that means that the Sabbath has begun. So a happy Sabbath to those of you here in this venue, those of you that are watching. We wish you also a happy Sabbath. Before we do our quiz tonight, I have a special offer for those of you that are here in this venue. This is a book that we're offering for those who want it. We're not going to just give it away to everyone. You can have the book, but you have to request it. And the way that you do that, the way that you can do that, is right on the back of your quiz card, H.C. That's for this book, He is Coming. This is a book dealing with some of the evidences that Christ's coming is near. I was reading through parts of it earlier, and I thought, this is I would like to read the whole book. So I'm going to keep my own copy. 
If you'd like to have one, you can have one right on the back of your quiz card, 8C. And then just make sure your name and address is on the front. Sometimes people turn in a card and they have the code on the back side. And I look it over, turn it over, and there's no name on the front. So if you want the book to actually get to your address, then make sure your address is on the other side. That's just for those who want it. HC is the book code. Almost sounds like HCBN television, huh? But it's just HC for He's Coming. Thank you tonight for those of you who have given offerings for our seminar expenses. We appreciate that. Here's our quiz. Are you ready for the quiz? Does everyone have a quiz card? Take out your quiz card. Pull it out of that envelope if you can get it out. We're going to go through our questions from our last lecture, The Antichrist Cover-Up. Question number one is true or false. According to the Bible, there are many antichrists. According to the Bible, there are many antichrists. So on line one, write T or F or true or false. Number two is true or false. Instead of being an obviously evil, openly anti-Christian person who will rise from outside of the church, the real antichrist will be like Judas, an insider, professedly Christian. Instead of being an obviously evil, openly anti-Christian person who will rise from outside of the church, the real antichrist will be like Judas, an insider, professedly Christian. On line two, write True or false for number two. Number, th number three now. True or false, blasphemy according to the Bible is when a man makes himself God on earth. Blasphemy according to the Bible is when a man makes himself God on earth. Question number four is the question, what does a day represent in Bible prophecy? What does a day represent in Bible prophecy? By the way, those of you that are watching on television or the internet, you can take the quiz also on a piece of paper. Question number five, our final one now, is a question also. Is the Antichrist beast of Revelation a man or a kingdom? Is the Antichrist beast of Revelation a man or a kingdom? Write your answer on line five. Let's go back through our quiz and see how well we did. You can grade yourself. Question number one. According to the Bible, there are many antichrists. What's the answer? That is true. According to John, 1 John 2, 18 and 19. Number two, instead of being an obviously evil, openly anti-Christian person who will rise from outside of the church, the real antichrist will be like Judas, an insider, professedly Christian. What's the answer? That's also true. You may remember Paul called the antichrist the son of perdition. Jesus called Judas the son of perdition. Same reference. All right, number three, blasphemy according to the Bible is when a man makes himself God on earth. What's the answer? That is true. Question number four, what does a day represent in Bible prophecy? A day represents a year in Bible prophecy. And the final question, is the Antichrist beast of Revelation a man or a kingdom? It is a kingdom. A beast in Bible prophecy represents a... A what? A kingdom. We saw that. If you, were, if you weren't here, you might, might have missed that. How many of you got 100% on the quiz? All right, looks like many of you did. And again, if you want the free book, you can have it by request. It's only by request. Put HC on the back of your quiz card before you drop it in the bucket. Let's pass our baskets now. And while we do that, we're going to sing this hymn, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus." If you know the song, sing with us. You can put your questions, your prayer requests also on that quiz card. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take it out. Jesus 
Somehow our slides got mixed up. I don't know how that happened, but anyway. As you came in, you probably dropped off your ticket, verifying you've been coming. After you come to 15 lectures, you get to keep your Bible as a gift from the seminar. And we are at number 11 tonight. By the time we get through this weekend, you come in the morning. You can add another one to your list. And I think many of you got your DVD if you haven't, then probably it's because we didn't have quite your right address. It didn't get to you. But this DVD you got is number one, disc number one. There are actually two of these. So the videos that are with the DVD, they're not on this one. They're on the next one. But you'll have on this one the books, the audio, and hopefully most of you got that by now. As you go out tonight, your lesson is this one, number 17, God Drew the Plans. And we do invite you to do the summary sheet at the back of the lessons. If you get them all done, drop them off, turn them in after you come check them. Then we'll grade them and return them to you. You can get a diploma at the end of the seminar. Tomorrow morning, what time? 10 o'clock. We'll meet right here for our study, The Three Steps to Heaven. We'll take some time for questions. We're also going to have a, a short health lecture with Dr. Doris Mendoza. And then in the evening at our normal time, our topic will be Antichrist and the Mysteries of Egypt. By the way, what's our normal time in the evening? Six, six o'clock. I invite you to be here at six. I know our advertisement originally said seven, but we changed that to six. We've been starting every night at six. And then on Sunday, our topic is the devil's door. This is a door that many people have unwittingly opened. And they've suffered as a result. What's the door? Well, we'll look at that on Sunday. I'll show you how to keep that door closed. So we have some exciting topics this weekend. Tomorrow, I should mention, I'm going to share the five-minute plan to have victory over a bad habit. So if you have a bad habit you like to kick... Get rid of, be sure and be here in the morning. 10 o'clock, we'll start. Let's stand now and sing our theme song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let's stand together. If you're watching, you can stand with us if you're in another venue.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that it is now the Sabbath. You've kept us, been with us through a busy week. We pray we might enter into your rest, the Sabbath rest during these hours. And as we are here now to study, bless us, we pray. Those that are watching, guide our thoughts as we consider the longest prophecy in the Bible. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. Our topic for tonight, the Bible's longest, most amazing prophecy. I invite you to open your Bible as we begin to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Tonight, I'm going to issue to you a court summons. You have a case pending in court. Let's read about it here from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. If you have a seminar Bible, we have the page there for you. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, our first text. Those of you taking notes, mark it down. The Bible says, for we must all, how many of us? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to the, that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You have a case pending before the judgment bar of Christ. No higher court in the universe. From that court, there'll be no appeal to a higher court because that is the highest court. The Bible says in Romans 14, verse 12, So then, every one of us, how many of us? Every one of us shall give account of himself to who? God. To God. Another text, this is what Peter says, 1 Peter 4, verse 17. For the time is come. We're going to find out tonight when that time came. The time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, Peter says... What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So the Bible talks about judgment. We each have a case pending before the court of the universe. Someday God is going to hand down a sentence upon every person. In fact, let's notice that from the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. Last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 11. This is easy to remember. Revelation 2, 2, 1, 1. Revelation 22, verse 11. Page is there for you on this, in the seminar Bible. Revelation 22, verse 11. Have you found it? Some of you have. <laughs> Revelation 22, verse 11 says, He that is unjust, <clears throat> let, let him be unjust, what? Still... And he which is filthy, let him be filthy. Still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous. Still. And he that is holy, let him be holy. Still. No changing. God pronounces a sentence. After that sentence is handed down, what happens? Let's read the very next verse. Revelation 22, verse 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give how many? Every man according as his work shall be. When Christ comes back, he brings a reward for every person. In order for Christ to bring a reward for every person, there has to be a judgment first to determine what rewards to bring everybody, right? So before Jesus comes back in the clouds of heaven, a message goes to the whole world that we are living in the time of God's judgment. Let's read that message from Revelation 14. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. This is the first of the three angels' messages. God sends these messages to prepare the world for end time. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. John says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The message goes to how far? To the whole world. What's the message? Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? His judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So the message is the hour of God's judgment is come. Not something that will come, something that is come. It has arrived. 
Well, that brings us to two questions. When did this judgment begin? And where is this judgment taking place? To answer that, we need to leave the book of Revelation and go to another great prophetic book. What book? The book of Daniel. Let's go back to Daniel 7. We were studying from Daniel 7 in our last lecture. Let's go back to Daniel 7. We'll read verses 9 and 10. And if you'd like to put a marker, you have a ribbon in your Bible. Put that ribbon here in Daniel. We're going to come back to Daniel or spend much of our evening here in Daniel. Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. Daniel says, are you there? Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. Daniel says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, more correctly translated, when they were set down. And the Ancient of Days did sit, this would be God the Father, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. Note that. The judgment was set, and what was open? The books were open. So here, Daniel, he looks up in vision. He sees God the Father seated there in flaming majesty. He sees all the angelic witnesses. And then he says the judgment was set and the books were opened. Evidently, the books must contain the records of people that have lived. The wise man says, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, For God shall bring how many? Every work into what? judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The Bible teaches us that we are saved by grace, but the Bible also teaches us that we will be judged by our works. Our actions demonstrate whether we really have accepted the grace of Jesus into our lives. You might be hiding something from your wife or your husband or your employer, but you cannot hide from God. The Bible says God will bring every work into judgment. I don't know, you might have heard this story. I heard of this story. They were, they were having a movie in a packed cinema one day, and halfway through the movie, they turned off the film and they turned on the lights, and this announcement came over the loudspeakers. If there's anyone here with another man's wife, please leave immediately out the back door because her husband just ran in the front door with a gun. He says he'll kill you both. 17 couples got up and ran out the back door. <laughs> well, that might be funny if it weren't so tragic. We live in a corrupt world. God will bring every work into judgment. You might be hiding something from your wife, but you cannot hide from God. He'll bring every work into judgment. There's someone else there in the judgment scene that I'd like for you to notice. Daniel 7, verse 13. Daniel 7, 13. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of May, and came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Who is this Son of Man? That's Jesus. What is Jesus' position in the judgment? Well, he has several, actually. First of all, he is our lawyer. If you'd like to text for that, 1 John 2, verse 1. Jesus is our lawyer, our advocate, but he's also our judge. And if you like the text for that, John 5, 22 and 27. God the Father is the presiding judge, but Jesus will be the acting judge. So he's our lawyer, he's our judge. What else is he? Well, he ought to be our friend, right? And I already heard somebody mention it. He's also our Savior. Think about this. If you have to go to court for a crime, and your lawyer is also your judge, he's also your best friend, and he's already paid the penalty for your crime, do you need to fear the judgment? Not at all. You can look forward to the judgment because you know you will be justified. If Jesus is your lawyer, your judge, your friend, and your savior, I hope you'll be accepted him as that. So you have a picture of where the judgment's happening. It's taking place up in heaven. We don't go there in person. Jesus represents us there. Jesus is the 
the acting judge, God the Father, the presiding judge, but Jesus, the acting judge, our lawyer, our friend, Savior. And then you have the angels. They've seen everything we've done. They've heard everything we've said. They are the witnesses. So we see where the judgment's happening. It's happening up in heaven. But we want to answer the question tonight, when did this judgment begin? You find the answer also from the book of Daniel. Cross the page, or maybe it's the next page in your Bible, to Daniel 8, verse 14. Daniel 8, 14, we'll find out when the judgment began. Daniel 8, 14 says, And he said unto me, this is the angel speaking to Daniel, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. You say, Pastor, what does the cleansing of the sanctuary have to do with the judgment? Well, to answer that, we need to get a brief overview of the sanctuary and its services. And this is only going to be an overview. We don't have time in our, our brief study tonight to get into all the aspects, all the symbols of the sanctuary and its services. But let me give you a brief overview. The Bible tells us that there were two sanctuaries. There was an earthly sanctuary. There is a heavenly sanctuary. You can read about the sanctuaries, by the way, in the Bible in Hebrews 8, Hebrews 9. When God brought his people, the Hebrews, out of Egyptian bondage, he told them, let, me, let, let them make me a sanctuary. He told Moses that. You can read that in Exodus 25, verse 8. And then he told Moses in Exodus 25, verse 9 and verse 40, that they were to make this sanctuary according to the pattern that God had showed to Moses. The earthly sanctuary was a miniature type or replica of the vast, glorious, heavenly sanctuary. The earthly sanctuary and its services were God's illustration of the plan of salvation. If you forget everything I tell you about the sanctuary, don't miss this one point. The earthly sanctuary was God's illustration of the plan of salvation. How he's dealing with the problem of sin. All those types and ceremonies pointed forward to Jesus, his sacrifice, his ministry on our behalf. The earthly sanctuary was originally a tent-like building. You can see the painting here in the picture. Here is a diagram of what the sanctuary was like. You can see the dimensions there. It had two rooms. Outside the sanctuary in the courtyard, you see there were two pieces of furniture. First was the altar of sacrifice. This is where the lambs, usually it was the lambs, or the animals were slain. The sacrifice made for sin, rep representing how Jesus came outside of heaven, died on this earth for our sins. And then next to that, before entering the sanctuary building, you have the laver. This is where the priest would wash before going into the sanctuary. The sanctuary had two rooms. The first room was called the holy place. In the first room, they had three pieces of furniture. You can see them there. The table of showbread, the seven branch candlestick, and the altar of incense. And then separating the holy place from the most holy place, that was the second room, smaller room, you had a large curtain that Hebrew tradition tells us was about 10 centimeters thick to veil the tremendous glory of God, which was in the most holy place. The most holy place had one piece of furniture. That was the Ark of the Covenant. Here we have a painting, a diagram of the sanctuary. You can see the two rooms there, the holy place, the most holy place. And by the way, I might mention many of these things represent Jesus, his ministry, the table of showbread. Jesus is the bread of, the bread of life, right? The seven branch candlesticks. Jesus is the light of the world. The altar of incense, the incense of Christ's righteousness ascends up before God on our behalf. So many of these things represented Jesus. And then in the second room, the most holy place, you have the Ark of the Covenant. It was a golden box that had a solid gold lid on the top called the mercy seat. On the gold lid were two golden angels symbolizing the angelic host looking on the plan of salvation. By the way, the ark was a symbol of God's throne in heaven. Above the mercy seat, you have the Shekinah glory, the visible manifestation of God's presence on earth. And then if you look at the cutaway here in our painting, you can see inside the ark was what? What was inside? What's that thing you see in the picture? 
The law of God, the Ten Commandments, showing that God's law is the foundation of God's government. The earthly sanctuary actually had two services. It had a daily service and it had a yearly service. The daily service related to the holy place. The yearly service related to the most holy place. A two-phase ministry in the earthly sanctuary. That means there must be a two-phase ministry in what other sanctuary? The earthly is a type of what? The type of the heavenly. So there must be a two-phase ministry up there as well. Daily service, yearly service. Let me explain the daily service. In the daily service, when someone sinned, they would bring a sacrifice to the sanctuary there in the courtyard, usually a lamb. They would confess their sins on the lamb, and then they had to slay the animal. The priest would pour out most of the blood there at the altar of sacrifice. But then he would carry a little bit of the blood into the sanctuary and he would sprinkle it there before that large veil. What was beyond the veil? The ark, which contained what? The law of God. Sin is what? Sin is the transgression or the breaking of the law. So this was to show that the sin had been atoned for by the blood of the sacrifice. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. So the sin was forgiven through the blood of the sacrifice, the lamb. This happened every day. A record of the forgiven sin was recorded in the sanctuary in the sprinkled blood. So the sinner had been forgiven, and the proof for that, the evidence for that, the blood for that, was put there inside the sanctuary in the sprinkled blood. Now remember, this is all illustrating how God is dealing with the problem of sin. The sanctuary and its services is God's illustration of the plan of salvation. In the earthly sanctuary, sacrificial animals died every day, recognizing two facts about sin. Mark these down in your notes. Fact number one, sin brings death. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. You can read that, Romans 6, verse 23. But, here's the second fact. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the second fact that was illustrated every day in the Old Testament sanctuary was that no sinner had to die because the sacrifice, a substitute, had been provided. The substitute was, was what? Was the lamb, which symbolized who? Symbol of Jesus. That's why John says in John 1, this was John the Baptist speaking, recorded by John the Apostle, John 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God, describing Jesus. John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God. The Lamb was the one that died for sin. Who died for our sins? Jesus did. So the lambs represented that. So all year long, this record of the forgiven sins was going into the sanctuary in the sprinkled blood. Every day, record is going in there. As people would bring their sacrifices, the lamb was slain, the blood was spilled, so they were forgiven, and the proof went into the sanctuary in the sprinkled blood. You can imagine with that record of sin going in all year long, they needed to have a cleansing of the sanctuary. That happened once a year. That related to the most holy place. What was cleansed out of the sanctuary during the cleansing of the sanctuary, the yearly service, what was it? It was the record of those forgiven sins that had gone into the sanctuary. That record of those forgiven sins was cleansed out of the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. It was called the cleansing of the sanctuary. It happened once a year. On that day, the high priest would go into the most holy place. Only the high priest could do this. And only after he had carefully examined his own life, because if the high priest had sin in his life, what would happen to him as he went into God's presence? He would have died instantly. So he examined his own heart before he went in there. And he would offer the blood, he would sprinkle the blood of a sacrifice right on the mercy seat. What was beneath the mercy seat in the ark? The Ten Commandments. This was to show that all those sins throughout the year that had come in the sanctuary were now being cleansed out. 
The services of that day were called the cleansing of the sanctuary. It was also called the day of atonement. It was also called the day of judgment. So now you know that the cleansing of the sanctuary is the same as what? Is the same as the day of judgment. Ten days before the day of judgment, cleansing of the sanctuary, the priest would blow silver trumpets to announce the approaching day of judgment. What do you think the Hebrews did during that 10-day period leading up to the day of judgment? If you knew that you had 10 days left to live, how would you spend the next 10 days? Oh, I think we would search our hearts. We would confess our sins. We would want to make sure that everything was right between us and God and us and one another, right? That's exactly what the Hebrews did during that 10-day period. They examined their hearts, their lives, to make sure that all their sins had gone into the sanctuary so that when the sanctuary was cleansed, they would be clean. You see, when the sun went down on the Day of Atonement, the destiny of every Jew was fixed for the coming year. Any Jew that had unconfessed sin in his life, he was cut off from the camp of Israel, could not be saved. It was a national and an individual day of judgment. It's still the most important day of the Hebrew calendar, Yom Kippur, day of judgment. Representing how at end time, there'll be a great day of judgment where the destiny of every person will be determined for all eternity. The last day on the Hebrew calendar is the day of judgment. Symbolizing how there is a great day of judgment in the heavenly sanctuary at end time. And in the earthly sanctuary on the day of judgment, the cleansing of the sanctuary, what was cleansed out of the sanctuary? The record of sin. Which brings us to the question, is there a record of our forgiven sins in the heavenly sanctuary? The Bible told us from Daniel 7, verse 10, the judgment was set. And what was open? The books were opened. And we read from the wise man, Ecclesiastes 12, 14, for God shall bring every work into what? Into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We're all going to face the judgment someday. Let me explain a little bit more about the sanctuary, the Day of Atonement. You can read, by the way, the, the services that happen on the Day of Judgment in Leviticus 16, if you'd like to read the details. But let me explain a little bit about this. On the Day of Atonement, Day of Judgment, they had two goats that were provided. There was the Lord's goat, and there was the scapegoat. Now, when you think about what happened in the earthly sanctuary, a sinner, when they would sin, would offer a sacrifice, a substitute, that was usually a lamb. So his sin was transferred from himself to the substitute, the lamb. The lamb's blood was spilt, and its blood was carried into the sanctuary. That's what happened all year long. But on the Day of Judgment, the Day of Atonement, the record was brought back out and put on the scapegoat. The scapegoat was the one that was held responsible for sin. Which brings us to the question, who is responsible for sin? You understand that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. He is the one who died. The scapegoat did not die. It was led away by a fit man into the wilderness to die alone. The scapegoat was the one that was responsible for sin. Is Jesus responsible for our sins? No. Who's responsible for tempting us to sin? The devil. So one day, don't miss this, one day God is going to put the responsibility for sin right smack on the head of the one responsible. I think that's wonderful. That's what the scapegoat represented. Jesus is the one that paid the penalty, but he's not responsible for sin, for tempting us. That's the devil. So someday God is going to punish the devil for tempting us. Well, that's a brief overview we didn't have time to get into all the other aspects of the sanctuary. However, we have learned this. The cleansing of the sanctuary is the same as what? It's the same as the day of judgment. So when we read in Daniel 8, verse 14, 
And he said unto me, for unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That simply means, then shall the judgment begin. 2,300 days. Now, that brings us to two questions. When does this 2,300 days begin and end? And which sanctuary is this talking about? The earthly sanctuary or the heavenly sanctuary? Let's go back to Daniel now, and we're going to find out. Daniel 8, verses 16 and 17. You're still there in Daniel? Well, I guess so somebody is. <laughs> the rest of you? Daniel 8, we're going to read verses 16 and 17. It says, Daniel says, I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, that's the river, which called and said, Gabriel, Gabriel was the angel, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Verse 17, so he, Gabriel, came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, understand, did God want Daniel to understand this vision? Yes or no? Yes. Does he want us to understand it? Oh, yes. Understand, O son of man, for at the what time? The time of the end shall be the vision. Let's mark down three facts about this 2,300-day vision. First of all, fact number one, this vision brings us all the way down to the time of what? Time of the end. That's the first fact. You can mark these three facts in your notes if you like. Fact number one, this 2,300-day vision brings us to the time of the end. Fact number two... Which sanctuary is this talking about? Earthly or heavenly? Earthly sanctuary is no more. It was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. It has never been, the Jewish temple has never been rebuilt. Far as I'm concerned, it never will be rebuilt. I know at least one preacher that's offered $1,000 for concrete proof from the Bible that the Jewish temple will be rebuilt at end time. I know there's a lot of people that think it will be. There's theories that it will be. You hear a lot about it will be, but where's the proof? And even if they did rebuild the Jewish temple, would it be God's temple? The temple of God now after Jesus' death on the cross, now the focus is on the temple in heaven. So since the earthly sanctuary no longer exists after Christ's death, 40 years later it was destroyed by the Romans, we know then that this 2,300-day vision has to apply to which sanctuary? The heavenly sanctuary. That's the second fact. Fact number one, it brings us to the time of the end. Fact number two, this vision applies to the heavenly sanctuary. Fact number three, time here is symbolic. We have 2,300 days. 2,300 literal days would be about 6.3 years. Would 6.3 years bring us from the days of Daniel to the days of the end of time? Yes or no? No, of course not. 6.3 years from Daniel's day does not bring you to the end of time. So this cannot be literal time. It has to be symbolic time. And we've already learned that in prophecy, a day represents... A day represents what? A year. We found that from Ezekiel 4, 6. God says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. Numbers 14, 34. God says, each day for a year. So in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. That's just in the prophecy parts of the Bible. Any other time you read about a day, it's a 24-hour period. The creation, seven days of creation, that was 24-hour periods. But in prophecy, when you have symbols, a day in prophecy represents... A year. We have 2,300 days. That would be what then? 2,300 years. There is the Bible's longest, most amazing prophecy. 2,300 years. About this time, Daniel was getting confused. Let's read the last verse of Daniel 8. Daniel 8, 27. Daniel 8, verse 27. It says, And I, Daniel, fainted. And was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Daniel, he's trying so hard to understand this longest prophecy. The Bible says he fainted. Some of you are probably thinking, Pastor, this is a complicated topic tonight. I'm not sure I understand everything. Well, don't feel bad. Daniel didn't either. And the Bible tells us he actually fainted in the effort to understand I haven't seen anybody faint yet, have I? 
And they look around. Nah, sometimes people fall asleep. <laughs> but it looks like everybody's pretty well. Or nobody's fainted yet. Daniel 8 ends with Daniel getting sick and fainting. Daniel 9 begins with Daniel's earnest prayer to understand this vision, especially the part about the 2,300 days or years. And the principle that we can learn from this, Bible prophecy can only be correctly understood, truly understood, through earnest prayer. If we want to understand complicated prophecy, we have to, like Daniel, pray that God make us understand just like he made Daniel understand. So I want to do something kind of different tonight, if you'll permit me. I'd like to stop right in the middle of our study and have another prayer that God make us understand, help us understand, just like he helped Daniel understand. Could we do that? And just for the sake of revival, if you felt like you were getting sleepy, I'm going to ask you to stand for prayer. This might help to revive you physically. And then we're going to sit back down and look at the Bible's longest prophecy. So let's stand together for just a moment and have a prayer for God's help. Bow your head with me as we pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we pause here in the midst of our study to ask for divine wisdom, I pray for special grace and ability to present this complicated prophecy in a simple way. And we pray that you would give us understanding minds. As you made Daniel understand, make each of us understand. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. I trust you're revived now. In answer to Daniel's prayer, God sent the angel Gabriel back down to Daniel to explain the vision, especially this longest prophecy. The angel began by telling Daniel that this longest prophecy would be divided into two parts. The first 490 years would be for the Jews, and then the remaining 1810 years would bring us down to the time of the judgment. 490 plus 1810, that gives us our total that we're looking at, 2,300 days or years. Let's look at the first part here, the 490 days or years for the Jews. We'll read about it from Daniel 9, verse 24. Here the angel is beginning to explain to Daniel this prophecy. Daniel's been praying. You can read his prayer in verses 4 through 19. So now we have the answer to his prayer. Daniel 9, verse 24. The angel says to Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision in prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. 70 weeks are for your people. Who were Daniel's people? They would be the Hebrews, the Jews. But the angel said 70 weeks are determined for your people. The word determined in the original Hebrew means to be cut off of, amputated off of, separated off of. What would the 70 weeks be cut off from? Well, the only thing you could cut them off from in the context of what we're studying here would be the 2,300 years. So 70 weeks or 490 days or years would be cut off from this prophecy for Daniel's people, for the Jews. Seventy weeks, seven days of the week, that gives us 490 days or years because we're studying prophecy. But the question, of course, is when does this all start? The first part, last part, the part for the Jews, the 2,300 years. When's it all begin? Let's read the answer from the next verse. Daniel 9, verse 25. Daniel 9, 25, the angel tells Daniel, Know therefore and understand that from, from when? From the going forth of the commandment, or decree that is, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. By the way, here's another prophecy. I hope you're not getting confused. We have three prophecies that are all converging together. We have the prophecy for the Jews, the longest prophecy, and the prophecy that brings us to the Messiah. But it all starts 
from the decree to restore and build Jerusalem. Jerusalem at this time lay in ruins. It had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Daniel is a captive in a foreign country. And so the angel tells Daniel, when the decree goes forth, that you can restore and rebuild your city. Not just rebuild it, but restore it to being a city-state. That will be the starting date. When was that date? Oh, some of you remember. We studied that already in our lectures. That date was 457 B.C. in the fall. You can read the actual decree of King Artaxerxes in Ezra 7, verses 11 to 26. The decree is found in the Bible that allowed the Jews to not only rebuild their city, but to restore themselves to be a city government again, restoring them. The date was 457 B.C. in the fall. This is confirmed by the encyclopedia. Here we have the date, 457 B.C., and the encyclopedia says Artaxerxes I decrees that the city government of Jerusalem shall be reestablished. See Ezra 7. Daniel 9 and Nehemiah 1 in the Old Testament. So now we have our starting date. What's the date? 457 B.C. in the fall. That's when all these prophecies start. And the, the angel told Daniel, Daniel 9, 25, from the going forth of the decree. When was the decree? 457 B.C. in the fall. To restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score in two weeks. This is a prophecy we already studied in our lectures if you've been attending. Seven plus three score in two or 62 is 69 weeks. 69 weeks, seven days of the week would be 483 days, but we're studying prophecy, so that would be 483 years, would bring us down unto the time of time of the Messiah. 69 weeks. Let's diagram that. We have our starting date, the 457 B.C. By the way, I think many of you got our diagram of this prophecy already. 483 years, that's the 69 weeks, brings us to Messiah. And notice we have one week left, seven years left of the total period for the Jews, the 490 years, the 70 weeks. 69 weeks brings you to Messiah. And then there's one more week left, seven years left. And we know where that fits. It fits right there in the context. 69 weeks brings us to Messiah's baptism. He was baptized in 27 AD. And we confirm that from the Bible. Here's another diagram. You have the 483 years from 457. You come down to 27 AD in the fall. And I want to remind you, you have to leave out the zero. I know a lot of people, when they do the calculating, they think, what well, doesn't add up quite right? That's because of the zero. Mathematically, you go from minus one to zero to plus one. But that's not how it worked in history. They went from 1 BC to 1 AD. So you have to add plus one for the zero, because they didn't have a zero year. So if you, as long as you calculate that, a full 483 years from the fall of 457 will bring you to the fall of 27 AD. What was happening? Let's review. Luke 3 verse 1 says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. What year? 15th year. History tells us Tiberius began to rule in 12 AD. So his 15th year would be 12 plus 15. 27 A.D. What was happening? Well, the Bible told us, Luke 3, verses 1 and 3, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, what year was that? 27 A.D. He, John the Baptist, came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And among those who came for baptism was who? Jesus. He was baptized what year? 27 A.D., and don't let that confuse you. He was 30 years old when he was baptized. He was bat born, actually, about 4 B.C. People think, well, he was supposed to be born between, right there between B.C. and A.D. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. He was actually born about 4 B.C. So he's 30 years old in 27 A.D. And we learned already that in Hebrew, Messiah means anointed one. Christ in Greek means anointed one. And the Bible tells us in Acts 10, 38, that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. When did God do that? 
at his baptism. You can read that from Luke 3, 21 and 22. The Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, and the voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What year? 27 A.D. in the fall. Jesus began to preach. Mark 1, 15. The time is fulfilled. What time? The time prophecy of Daniel 9. Jesus says, look, the Messiah, according to Daniel 9, is supposed to be here. Here I am. The time is fulfilled. The Messiah is supposed to be here. I'm here right on time. It's amazing. Jesus came exactly on time according to the prophecy. Here is a diagram, another diagram. We're going to give you a copy of this, by the way, on your way out, so you don't have to try to draw it. If you're watching, by the way, we hope to have this uploaded soon so you can download it. A copy of the diagram you're seeing on the screen. We're looking at the first part of this longest prophecy, the 490 years for the Jews. 483 years, that's the 69 weeks, brings us from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah. His baptism, that was in 27 AD. And then you have one more week or seven years. In the middle of that one-week period, in 31 A.D., in the spring, Jesus died on the cross, fulfilling prophecy. Let's note the prophecy from Daniel 9, verse 27. Daniel 9, verse 27. Are you still there? You are. I'll get there. <laughs> Daniel 9, 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. One week is how long? Seven days or seven years. And in the midst of the week, the middle of seven would be three and a half. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So he'll bring an end to the sacrifices. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate, or the margin says the desolator. So it says, he shall confirm the covenant. Who is the he here in Daniel 9, 27? That is Jesus Christ. Now, it's amazing to me, there are some theologians, modern theologians, that say the he of Daniel 9 is the Antichrist. I don't know why they would say that the he of Daniel 9 is the Antichrist because you don't find the Antichrist mentioned in Daniel 9. The whole context of Daniel 9 is Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. But there are some theologians, they say that the he is the Antichrist. They lift this verse out of its context. They stick it down in the future. And that's how they end up with a seven-year tribulation at end time. Some of you might have heard of a seven-year tribulation at end time. It's based on Daniel 9, 27. But that prophecy does not apply to the Antichrist. It applies to Jesus Christ. He, Jesus, shall confirm the covenant with many, that was with the Hebrews, for one week, seven years, and in the middle of the weeks, three and a half, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. When Jesus died on the cross, what happened? The Bible says in Mark 15, 38, then the veil, that 10 centimeter thick veil, the veil of the temple was torn or ripped in two from top to bottom. What did that signify? The earthly sanctuary services now had come to an end. Why? Because Jesus had died on the cross. We don't have to offer lambs anymore. Aren't you glad? No more sacrificing of lambs because Jesus, the Lamb of God, died on the cross. He brought an end to the sacrifice and offering. That's why it says in Daniel 9, 27, and he, that's Jesus, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There it is. You can see it in the diagram. And in the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. When he died on the cross, right in the middle of the week, well, if you add three and a half years later, you come from 31 A.D., three and a half years later brings you to the fall of 34 A.D., what happened? You can read in Acts 7, verses 54 to 60, Stephen was stoned to death, 34 A.D. in the fall. This is confirmed in history. This is the, from the encyclopedia, 34 A.D., it says, St. Paul, St. Barnabas, started preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 8 tells us the gospel went to the Gentiles. What year? 34 A.D. 
And then the encyclopedia also says Stephen, the first martyr of Christianity, stoned to death by the Jewish leaders for preaching Jesus was the Christ. What year? 34 AD. In 34 AD, don't miss this, God's covenant with the Jewish nation came to an end. God rejected the Jews from being his chosen people because they rejected Jesus. Can Jews still be saved today? Oh, yes. How? By receiving Jesus individually. But as a nation, God has rejected them because they rejected Jesus. That happened in 34 AD. In 34 AD, the 490-year probation for the Jews came to an end. And that is why now in the New Testament, the Christian is the true Jew. That's why Paul says, don't miss this, Galatians 3.29, Paul says, And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All the promises that were made to ancient Israel are for you if you are whose? If you are Christ. Are you Christ? How many of you here are Christ? You belong to Christ. You've accepted Christ. Let me see. Oh, looks like most of you. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So in 34 AD, we, bring, we come to an end of the 490 years, the 70 weeks. If we take 34, we add that to our remaining period, 1810. That's what's left of this longest prophecy. We come down to What? 1844. In 1844, the judgment began in heaven. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? How can you prove that? Well, notice we have four anchor points for our prophecy. We have the first day, 457 B.C. in the fall. That checks out with chronology, checks out with history. It's one of the most clearly established Bible dates. So that checks out accurate. We have our second day, 27 A.D. in the fall when Jesus was baptized. That checks out accurate. We have our third day, Christ's death on the cross in the spring of 31 A.D. That checks out accurate. Our fourth day, 34 A.D., when the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Four anchor points for the prophecy. Just as surely as those first four dates are correct, we can know that the last date, 1844, is also correct. If 1844 is not the date for the judgment, then those other dates must also be wrong. Don't miss this. Any person that discredits 1844 as the date for the judgment is denying that Jesus is the Messiah of Daniel chapter 9. Because the whole prophecy either stands together or it all falls apart. If 1844 is wrong, then so are those other dates. Then we can't really prove that Jesus was the Messiah fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel 9. The Bible tells us, unto 2,000, read with me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, or then shall the judgment begin. If you calculate from 457 in the fall, you'll come down to 1844 in the fall. Remember, there's no zero year. So you have to add the one there. In 1844, the judgment began in heaven. That's why the message is sounding today. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. It's not something that will come. It is come. Since 1844, the judgment has been taking place, starting probably with Adam. God has been coming down the ages, examining the lives of people that have lived on planet Earth, What did the Bible say? We must, how many of us? All appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone has a case pending, so do you. Someday, your name will be called. Why? Because before Jesus comes back, there has to be a decision. What reward to bring you? When Jesus returns, he brings rewards for how many people? Every person. So there has to be a judgment first to determine what rewards to bring everyone. And that judgment began in 1844. In the Old Testament, before the judgment, they sounded the warning, judgment is approaching. And what did the Hebrews do? They searched their hearts. What should we be doing today? 
given the fact that we're living in the hour of God's judgment, we ought to be examining our lives to see if we really have surrendered everything to Jesus. If you've surrendered all to Jesus, do you need to fear the judgment? Not at all. But if you are rebelling against God, God's leading in your life, if you're practicing some secret sin, you're hiding from your husband or from your wife, it's not going to go well with you. Now, I want to give you hope, courage, as you think about the judgment. We have a lawyer that's offered to take our case. That's Jesus. Let's read about him here from 1 John 2, verse 1. Put this in your notes today. 1 John 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who's the advocate? Jesus Christ, the righteous. What's another word for advocate, a modern word? A lawyer. We have a lawyer. Who's the lawyer? Jesus. Is he your lawyer? I hope so. If he is your lawyer, you don't have to fear the judgment. If you don't have him for a lawyer, there is no other lawyer that can help you pass. You can't stand in your own strength and pass. Not possible. Here's another promise. Mark this one in your notes today. Jude 1 verse 24 says, Now unto him, that's Jesus, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you how? faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So in the judgment, if you've given yourself to Jesus, he presents you how? Faultless. How can he do that? How many of you here are faultless? May I see your hand? You're faultless, no faults. So how can he present us faultless when we are so faulty? Here's how. Jesus died for our sins. He paid the penalty for those faults. And because he paid the penalty for those faults, he can forgive us, and more than that, he can cleanse us. I want you to notice the order here in Jude 1, verse 24. It says, Now unto him, that's Jesus, that is able to do what? Able to keep you from falling. From falling into what? Falling into sin. So first he keeps you from falling, and then he presents you before the Father. Faultless. Can he present me faultless before the universe if I'm still practicing sin in my life here in this world? Can Jesus blot the records of my sins off the books of heaven if I'm still practicing those sins in this life? No. He's got to first blot them out of my life here before he can blot them off the books up there. Now, here's the question. Does Jesus have the power to keep you from falling? Can he keep you from falling into sin? Does he have that kind of power? We read from John 1, verse 12, as many as receive Jesus, they receive what? They receive power. You don't have the strength. You try keeping yourself from falling. You, you know you can't. It's not possible in your own strength. But in the power of Jesus, is it possible? Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. Jesus has enough power to keep you from falling. Can you say amen? amen. Oh, I'm going to show you tomorrow morning. I hope you're here tomorrow morning how to have a victorious Christian life. Well, look at that, the keys for that. But mark the order. First, he keeps you from falling, and he has the power. If you fall into sin, whose fault is it? God's fault or my fault? It's my own fault. It's my choice. If I choose his power, he has... I tell people God would rather send every angel out of heaven, and there are billions of them. God would rather send every angel out of heaven to your side to give you the power to resist temptation than see the devil beat you. God will do that. He'll send all the angels of heaven to protect you, but it's your choice. You have to choose. Lord, I give you my choice. I accept your power. And then you have to turn from that temptation. He keeps you from falling, and then he presents you faultless before the presence of his glory. How will it be for you when your name is called in judgment? What will it be like when your name is examined? Let me just, for example, use myself. Let's imagine that a name rings out in heaven in the judgment. Lowell Hargraves. 
that's my name, Lowell Hargraves. And the universe turns its attention to the records of Lowell Hargraves. There's the long catalog of all my sins. I wouldn't want you to see them. They're there, recorded. And maybe there's a moment of silence. And then I can imagine that Jesus stands up. And he said, I am here today to represent Lowell Hargraves. Yes, he sinned, but he's confessed those sins to me. And beside each sin, they can see there in the evidence on the record books, confess, pardoned. Confess, pardoned. Confess, pardoned. There's the evidence. And I can imagine Jesus says, my blood. I plead my blood on behalf of Lowell. Yes, he sinned, but I've made atonement for those sins. And I've been working in his life. And the universe can look down and see the evidence. I've been transforming him. I've been empowering him. And as the universe looks at the record, I can imagine someone says, erase the record. And all that long catalog of my forgiven sins is blotted out. You can read about that, by the way, the times of refreshing, the blotting out, Acts chapter 3. All that is blotted out, and in its place is put the perfect character of Jesus. If Jesus stands for me there in the judgment, how will I do in the judgment? How will I do? I remember one time I was preaching this meeting in a city in the southern part of America. And there was this old grandma sitting in the back. And I asked the question, I said, if Jesus stands for me in the judgment, how will I do? And she called back. She said, you'll do all right. You'll do all right. How about you? Will you do all right? If Jesus stands for you in the judgment, you'll do all right. You need not fear the judgment. Yes, we face the judgment. Every person has a case pending. You do too. When Jesus comes back, he, has, he brings his reward for you, so there has to be a judgment first. But you don't have to fear the judgment. As long as you've accepted Jesus, surrendered your life fully to Jesus, would you like to ask Jesus tonight, Lord, when my name is called, please stand for me in heaven. How many want to ask him to do that? May I see your hand tonight? We're going to end our meeting by singing this classic hymn, Is My Name Written There on the Page White and Fair? You know the song, sing with it. Let's stand together as we sing this song. Sing with us if you know it. If not, you can learn it tonight. It's a beautiful hymn. Lord, I care not for just neither. by the way, is the book of life. 
The Bible says only those whose names are in the book of life will be saved. Is your name written there? I pray, I pray God that it is. Let's bow our heads as we pray tonight. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have hope in facing the judgment with Jesus. We ask you tonight, Lord, to stand in our place there to be our lawyer, our judge, our friend, our savior. We surrender all to you tonight, Jesus. Those sins that we have practiced, we've been practicing here, blot them out of our lives, we pray. Empower us to be victorious Christians. And then we ask you to blot those off the record books above. And when our name is called, may we stand clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, we pray. Bless each one who's here, each one who's watching. Give us hope in Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.